In September 2014, 10 years ago this month, a new podcast was launched. Jesus never promised his followers an easy path. In fact, he told his disciples the world would hate them. The topic of that first episode was the persecution of Christ's followers in China. Welcome to the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network. We're excited to have you with us today. We've By got God's great grace, program that program grew and continued to highlight ways God's kingdom was being built, even in countries hostile to the gospel. Radio stations began to broadcast the program, and today we commemorate 10 years of bringing you these powerful stories through the Voice of the Martyrs Radio. Jesus never promised his followers an easy path. In fact, he told his disciples that the world would hate them. He sent them out as sheep among wolves. Jesus' words came true in the life of the apostles, and they're still coming true today in the lives of his followers around the world. Join host Todd Nettleton as we hear their inspiring stories and learn how we can help, right now on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network. My name is Todd Nettleton. We're marking the 10-year anniversary of the Voice of the Martyrs Radio We're going to hear highlights from the last decade, and we'll start with an episode that went viral. Really, the first time VOM Radio went viral, it featured Gina from the Frontier Missions effort at YWAM, Youth with a Mission. In 2015, Gina told us how God was at work drawing Muslims to himself. She gave us a couple of amazing examples. The first was from Algeria. The same night in the same village, a whole group of men had the same dream about Jesus Christ saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no (laughs) man comes to the Father but by me. And it actually started one of the few movements that we know of in that part of the world. One of our uh, YWAM workers in the Middle East was contacted by a friend uh, earlier this year, and they met up, and he was introduced to an ISIS fighter The fighter admitted uh, that he had killed Christians and that he had actually enjoyed doing so. Uh, He told this YWAM leader that he had begun having dreams of this man in white who came to him and said, you are killing my people. And he started to feel really sick and uneasy about what he was doing. The fighter said that uh, just before he killed one Christian, the man said, I know you will kill me, but I give to you my Bible. The Christian was killed, and this ISIS fighter actually took the Bible and began to read it. And then in another dream, Jesus asked him to follow him. And he was now asking to become a follower of Christ and to be discipled. So who knows? (laughs) Perhaps this man will be like Saul in the Bible that persecuted Christians, and he turned from that uh, persecution in the early church to become the Apostle Paul who led it. Back in 2015, that was not the only story that we had the opportunity to share here on VOM Radio of ISIS fighters coming to faith in Christ. We also heard from a gospel worker with Operation Mobilization. For his security, we're just calling him Julian. I was at a prayer event in Egypt in October, and we were delighted to hear two accounts of ISIS guys coming to faith. One is about a a fighter who suddenly, unexpectedly, out of the blue, had a vision of the cross. He leaves Syria, goes into Turkey, and meets a believer who's able to share the gospel, and he comes to faith. The other account we heard was uh, from Lebanon. There was a taxi driver who was a believer up at the border with Syria, and into his taxi gets this guy with a big beard, And the guy with the beard says, uh, take me to the airport. I'm flying home to Saudi. But on the way, I want to find a Bible. Can you find me a Bible? (laughs) And the taxi driver knew a Christian worker in Beirut who was very happy to give the guy with the beard the Bible. And then, sir, would you like to tell us why you're looking for a Bible? And his response was, I'm uh, from Saudi. I'm a sheikh. I've, which means a teacher of Islam. I've been in Syria teaching the ISIS fighters jihad 101, the theology and practice of jihad. I'm sick of the killing. I'm Todd Nettleton. This is the Voice of the Martyrs Radio. We are marking 10 years as a podcast and radio broadcast, listening back to some of the most moving moments from the last decade. So far in today's program, we have heard multiple stories of people hearing the good news of Jesus and coming to faith in Christ. 
the people who share this message often have to pay a high price. Helen Berhane knows about this cost. In her African nation of Eritrea, the government banned evangelical worship services, but Helen continued meeting with other believers and worshiping the Lord. She was tortured, then held in a metal shipping container for more than two years. But she says following Jesus is worth the suffering. Everything costs you price. When you buy a bread, it costs you price. When you buy a car, it costs you price. Also, when you follow Jesus, it costs you price. Everything costs price. So just I stand by faith. Sometimes it hurts. David Bile is another VOM Radio guest that knows sharing the gospel includes risks. In Turkey, evangelism is protected by law, but in reality, it's risky for believers to openly share the gospel. David Bile shared anyway and ended up in jail. When the police showed up, like, wow, God's got something amazing in store for these upcoming days. <laughs> that was my first reaction. And sure enough, he did. They took me to the local police station, put me in the cell down in the basement. And there was this, this guy down there, a Kurdish atheist, who I found out later had been living in the red light district of Istanbul for the last 15 years or so, doing every sort of filth and crime imaginable, except killing. He, you know, he thought that was horrible, especially in the name of religion. And he was off to 10 plus years in prison. Wow. And he learns this just a few minutes before I show up. I didn't have any problem convincing Sam that he was a sinner and that he needed <laughs> salvation. And I had my uh, Turkish New Testament with me, which they let me take with me, by the way. I showed it to him. He sort of just gruffly, oh. he opens it up and the, uh, his eyes land on the verse, uh, the story of the woman caught in adultery. His first verse he reads is, did not Moses command that all those caught in adultery should be stoned? Uh, I just said, uh, just keep reading. Anyways, he reads on farther. He gets to the bit where Jesus said, he who has no sin, let him throw the first stone. Now, you remember, he himself is a serial adulterer and much worse. And he reads that, and I wish you could have been there in the cell to see his reaction. He just stopped, and he goes, I like this Jesus guy. We wake up the next morning. He looks at me. He says, David, you won't believe it. I just had a dream, and in the dream, God said that he sent you here for me. How can a gospel worker like David Bile remain so calm while in prison? Uh, I think I would be tempted to fear. The guests that we've featured here on VOM Radio these last 10 years are real people. They are tempted to fear just like we are. For example, let's listen to a guest that we called Maria. Cuban authorities issued an arrest warrant for her husband. We're just calling him Pedro. Of course, Maria was afraid. I would shake. And when they were asking me questions, I felt like I couldn't breathe. But one day I started praying and I asked God, listen, you've chosen me for this job. You have to take this fear away. And I don't even know how this happened, but I was also afraid of flying in airplanes. And every time I flew, I was very scared. And the day that I lost my fear of flying, I didn't realize it, but I also wasn't afraid of being interrogated anymore. So my family doesn't want me to go to Cuba. And they say, aren't you afraid? And I tell them, no, what can they do to me? As we think back to some of the most moving moments of VOM Radio's first 10 years, let's hear from Dan Bauman. He was serving as a gospel worker in Central Asia. He and a friend decided to visit Iran. He thought it would be a short visit, but then ended up in prison. And I'll never forget the first day that I was taken, I was beaten by a man that would end up being the only man that would beat me. I was taken one day into his room, blood stains on the floor, a scary situation. But on that day, something happened. And all I can say is all glory to Jesus. And I looked at him and I said this. I said, sir, if I'm going to see you every day the rest of my life, why don't we become friends? This is the guy who has been beating on you every day for weeks. Yes. And you said, I want to be friends. And I stuck out my hand to shake his hand. And it was then that he froze. And as he froze, he starts to shake. Then he starts to look around. It's only me and him in there. <laughs> and then he took his hand out of his pocket 
and he reached it towards me, and he shook my hand. As he shook my hand, he squeezed it really tight, and he wouldn't let go. Then tears start to come down his face, and then he finally looks at me and says, Dan, and he called me by my name. He said, my name is Razak, and yes, I would love to be your friend. And I knew that God had changed that man's heart. While in an Iranian prison, Dan Bauman came to know the Lord in a whole new way. We can learn from Dan's experience. You can hear the whole interview by visiting vomradio.net. You can also read more in Dan's book. It's called Cell 58. Peter Yasek has also experienced God's presence while in prison. Peter was serving as VOM's Africa Regional Director when he was arrested and imprisoned in the nation of Sudan. For 445 days, Peter leaned on the Lord to sustain him in some very dark places. Uh, my faith and my prayers have shifted from the questions for the asking the Lord how long I will be here or proclaiming the, the victory and the, the knowing that the Lord can open the, the door of my cell to the point when I realized what it means to wait for the Lord. On April the 11th, four months and one day in prison, that was the uh, evening uh, when uh, 14 Eritrean uh, young people, people who were arrested and brought to this prison. And I heard kind of inner voice inside me go and share the gospel with them. I knew that these people would definitely not be Muslim, so I started to share Christ with them, uh, share my testimony. I believe that at least two of them were very honest when, and, uh, when they, I brought them to the point to give their life to Christ. And I almost cried, you know, when I was sharing gospel with them, sharing my testimony. Uh, and uh, I believe that that was the, the, the eternal seed for their eternal life. And I'm sure that I will meet uh, at least some of them in heaven one day. And then I thanked the Lord and I clearly saw that the Lord has a purpose for me to be there another month. I stopped asking the Lord how long and I rather asked the Lord, how do you want me to use Lord? How do you want me? And I started to be more open even with the Muslims who were in this cell. That's Peter Yasek, who spent 445 days in a Sudanese prison. To hear his whole story, visit vomradio.net slash Peter. We're listening to some of the most moving moments from the first 10 years of the Voice of the Martyrs Radio this week. As we've heard over and over on today's program, following Jesus requires a cost. Nick and Ruth Ripkin felt like they had paid a very high price when they were serving as missionaries in Africa. They had suffered from malaria. Four of their closest Christian friends had been killed in Somalia. Then their 16-year-old son suddenly died. To gain perspective on all of this loss, Nick and Ruth became students of persecuted Christians. They wanted to learn from their brothers and sisters who had also experienced great trials and loss. So Somali believers are dead. Our son is dead. Our dreams are dead. And we want to know, is Jesus for the tough places, like where you guys report on, or is Jesus just for the dressed up Western church? And so where do we go to find the answers? We've already done the seminary. We've done the, the denominational schools. So we just decided to go to believers in persecution and really sit at their feet, humbled and broken, and ask them to teach us how do they make Christ known in hard places? How do they do more than survive, oftentimes thrive in persecution? And that led to the journey to where we're sitting together today. Yeah, and what we did was, as we met with believers, we shared with them our mistakes, as Nick said. We shared with them the things that had happened, and we asked them, please teach us. Those of us from the West, we don't know how to be wise partners with you. Teach us. And as We can't change being sheep among wolves, but we don't have to be stupid sheep. That's right. <laughs> and so we went to the sheep that uh -huh. were wise. They are still gentle, yeah. and they're broken, and they're crucified, but they're also resurrected. And sitting at their feet, humbly, as a Westerner, they very seldom experienced that, and them being the Paul 
and us being the Timothys, uh, that also was encouraging to them and to know that we were going to use what they had learned in persecution to strengthen other parts of the body of Christ. They would look at us in joy and sobbing and saying, then our persecution is worth it. That's Nick and Ruth Ripkin. Nick is the author of the book, The Insanity of God. As we are remembering highlights from the first 10 years of The Voice of the Martyrs Radio, let's stay on this theme of the cost of being a disciple. Anita Smith paid a very high price to serve the people of Libya. She and her husband, Ronnie, headed to Libya even though they knew it was a dangerous place. Ronnie was a beloved school teacher. This family was getting to know their neighbors and the community. Anita was back in the U.S. when a neighbor from Libya called with shocking news. It, they asked me to, like if I was sitting down, they said, I'm sorry, but they just said it, that Ronnie is dead. And I, it was just complete shock. And I kept saying, I don't understand. They're like, I'm sorry, but Ronnie is dead. And I said, just me saying, I don't, that, that can't be true. And they're saying, I'm so sorry, Anita, I'm so sorry. But Ronnie is dead. He, this morning, he was shot. And they were, they were crying. We had been with these families uh, for a year. And their husbands were really good friends with Ronnie. And the wives were really good friends with me. And even the grandma, who didn't speak any English, she was just crying and, and just like telling me I'm sorry. I do remember being on an airplane with a few friends going to Austin for our, the memorial service. And a good friend of mine and I, we were just talking. We were just having like a really good conversation about just hoping and dreaming that our life in Benghazi for Jesus didn't stop and finish there. And, and through that, we were praying even for the attackers, that, Lord, that you would reveal yourself to them and that they would know the love of Jesus. And that's how it came about, that I was remembering that Jesus calls us to love our enemies, to forgive them. Anita Smith went on to publicly forgive the people who had killed her husband, Ronnie. To hear that whole story, visit vomradio.net. That's also where you can hear another powerful story from Susanna Coe. Her husband, Pastor Raymond Coe, was serving in Malaysia. In 2017, Raymond was abducted off the streets. And now, more than seven years later, Susanna still doesn't know what happened to him. We miss him a lot. <laughs> And the, the hardest part is not knowing where he is, what happened to him, and how he's doing right now. And uh, I've gone for some counseling, and that really helped. And right now, my children are going for counseling because the, this has taken a toll on them. Mm physically as well as, I think, um, emotionally and psychologically. But we, we thank God for the Christian community and also the worldwide church that has been an encouragement to us. And they, they have uh, expressed their support through press and sending postcards to us. And I think that that really lifts up our spirits and and encourage us uh, in many ways. Yes. I hope you will continue praying for Susanna Coe and for her family as they continue to await news about her husband, Raymond. She's actually suing the Malaysian government. There's a lot going on with that case even this week. So please pray for Susanna. Pray for that court process. Stories like Susanna's will help us to lean on the Lord when we experience disappointment and loss. Here's another story from the archives of vomradio.net. Hanali Gronwald and her family were living in Afghanistan. She had left one morning to serve as a medical doctor. 
she returned to devastating news. Another worker phoned me and she said, where are you? Only uh, I want to come to you. And she sounded kind of hysterical. And I thought, what on earth is going on with this lady? And I told her where I were. And then other workers came, other missionaries came to me. And then th- these guys, I knew them very well. And they said, Hanley, this is going to be the longest night of your life. And I said, why? What's wrong? Who got injured? I really believed until the end that nothing happened. So at, at what point did it start to dawn on you? I'm a widow. My my children have been killed. My husband has been killed. How did How did that start to sink in? I think through the night I realized actually what was going on. And I cried a bit, but not that much. But I was so overwhelmed because it was not my NGO. And it's dangerous for people to come from abroad and close down the NGO. And I didn't know how to do that. So I just followed. But God had this wonderful thing of people taking the lead and helping me through this. Other missionaries that came and helped me. And... We, we closed down the NGO. We did what was needed to be done. I went to identify the bodies. I went to the house to see whether there was anything that I could retrieve. And there wasn't. That's Hanalee Gronwald. To hear more of her story, you can visit our website, vomradio.net. You can also, again, find VOM Radio wherever you listen to podcasts. Like the Gronwald family, Gary and Bonnie Witherall chose to put down deep roots in a country where there was a lot of hostility to the gospel. Gary and Bonnie moved to Lebanon and developed strong ties with both Lebanese people and with Palestinian refugees. But after the 9-11 attacks, their life in Lebanon became much more difficult. And then Bonnie was martyred for her faith. Here's what the Lord showed Gary right in the middle of his grief and loss. Gary, a seed has been planted in your heart, and this seed will grow and it's going to grow from anger to hatred, or it's going to grow from forgiveness to love. You need to choose. In this moment, I had this picture of looking through the eyes of Christ on the cross. Blood and tears coming down his face. And he's looking down at me. And in that moment, he says, um, Father, forgive him. Father, forgive him. And, and I realized probably the first time in my life, I'm forgiven. For everything. Everything. And I think that God reveals his wonder in our sorrow. And that's why Paul said, Lord, I want to know you in suffering. I want to even experience you in your death, you know. And I realized, like, actually, there was joy. Isn't that crazy? There was a real joy in my life in that moment. And I said, Lord, you have forgiven me of all things. Today I forgive whoever killed my wife. And it came fully. I mean, it was, I don't know, the spirit got on me, his arms around me. I don't know what it was. But from that day, and it's genuine. It's genuine. It's not like from that day to this day, I've lived in that victory of really knowing the power of forgiveness. And, And it is powerful. I'm Todd Nettleton. We have been remembering some of the most moving moments from the first 10 years of The Voice of the Martyrs Radio. Obviously, we only had time for a small sampling from the last 10 years. In fact, there are some I I almost weep that we had to leave out because our time is so short. I'd love to know what programs have stood out to you over the last 10 years. Are there some that you just think, how could they have left that one out? I'd love to hear from you this week. You can send me an email, radio at vom.org, radio at vom.org. Just send me a note. Let me know which story, which testimony, which brother or sister ministered to you over the last 10 years. And I will say, we did leave out one especially moving episode from our time today. That's because next week we're going to devote our entire time to talking with Sister Amber, She went through unspeakable events in a prison in Tibet. While being tortured, she experienced the presence of God in such a personal, such a real way, and God made a request of Amber in the midst of her suffering. We will hear that amazing story next week as we continue to celebrate 10 years of God's goodness, 10 years of sharing the incredible, inspiring stories of our persecuted brothers and sisters right here 
on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network.